So we have looked at two points, and I think we can say that in effect he was saying you are in large part, or at least to a degree, who you associate with and what you put into your mind. Now the third factor that he saw producing apostasy of people who left the church was breaking the commandments of God. We know, I'm quoting, we know that it, it is as strict a law of heaven as any law that has ever been given that the man who enters into this church and practices impurity will lose the spirit of God and sooner or later will be opposed to this work. I have heard that there is a disposition on the part of some to yield to the temptations that surround us, young men and young women falling away and being guilty of unchastity, young men going to billiard saloons, gambling saloons, drinking saloons, indulging in habits of smoking and swearing, not only young men, but persons of mature, er mat mature years. I am surprised at it. I am surprised that Latter-day Saints should have so little strength of character and so easily yield to these wicked influences. Well, obviously he's concerned about the inroads of the ways of the world and the different temptations, and he's seeing a certain number of people being drawn in that direction. Uh, I guess we might raise the question as to whether there are disenchantment with the Latter-day Saint religion and preceded or followed their drinking and smoking and swearing, et cetera, in the billiard halls. But in any case, they were closely linked. And Cannon had no respect for such people. I would not give a fig for a Latter-day Saint who could not, in the midst of these temptations, be sincere and true to his convictions and live the religion that God has revealed to him such men are not worthy of the name, and sooner or later they will lose name and standing in the church. In 1885, looking at the world around him, he, Cannon saw many discouraging cultural indicators. I think that's the term we use nowadays, cultural indicators. Quoting, the growth of intemperance, the spirit of infidelity, concerning everything pertaining to God and to righteousness, the spread of corruption, the low value placed upon virtue, the increase of the evils that result from the absence of virtue are of such a nature that if you look outside this church, the picture is a most discouraging one. Cannon had noticed the close connection between immorality and apostasy when he served as president of the British mission. The frequent apostasies from this church, he said, the many who have left the church denied the faith, lost the spirit of God, the most of them, no doubt, are traceable to the commitment of this sin. And you recall Joseph Smith's statement. <clears throat> you can find in Doctrine and Covenants 42 and 23 sometime, if you will recall this, he that looketh upon a woman to lust after her, shall deny the faith, and shall not have the Spirit of God. A fruitful source of apostasy, said Canon, is adultery, fornication, and lustful desires. Referring to illicit association, he said, in every such case that has come to my knowledge, where the man has not repented with full purpose of heart, he has lost faith, and God has shown his disapprobation of his conduct, by withdrawing his spirit from that man. You wonder what he would say in 2005. Um, see if you agree with me that this statement might be a warning against what we call pornography nowadays. A man can defile his tabernacle by indulging in lustful and improper thoughts. He can make his tabernacle an unfit receptacle for the Holy Ghost and this too without any outward breach of the law of God. In this way he can grieve the Spirit of God, and if he does not repent with all his heart, but continues in it, he will deny the faith. So we've looked at three factors that he saw as very basic. 
We conclude with the fourth and the most important, <clears throat> criticizing the presiding authorities of the church. In 1869, with the reorganized spiritualists and Godbeites all luring people away from the church, Cannon addressed the October conference. It's not primarily differences about doctrine, he said, that is at issue. Those who left the church seldom rejected the doctrines of faith, repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. The main issue was always the authority of church leaders. This is the point the adversary always aims at. There is no doubt but what the rock upon which they split was the question of the right and authority of those presiding over them. And he reviews. In fact, several of his sermons repeat this same exercise of reviewing the, the bestowal of the keys of authority on the prophet Joseph Smith, and then the transmission of those keys successfully to Brigham Young, John Taylor, and, other, and the others. In the days of Joseph Smith, he was the man against whom all the enemies of truth hurled their malicious shots. The wicked hailed these critics as brethren, consorted with them, became very brotherly, very fraternal, and looked upon them as very good, clever fellows. He's re looking at some of the psychology. And Brigham Young receiving that authority and his own refusal to participate in the criticism of, of President Young or any other of the, pre of the presidents of the church. He reviewed the authority of the apostles. Each of the apostles had the authority to lead and guide the people of God whenever he is called upon to do so. But only one of the apostles has the keys of presidency. And at this particular point in time, that individual was John Taylor. And George Buchanan places great emphasis on the importance of honoring the keys of authority in the church. You may see things in men that appear to you wrong and justify you in indulging in criticism and censorious remarks. And perhaps you may even feel justified in uttering words of condemnation, he said. But let me say to you, and I say it as the result of a lifetime's ex experience and observation, that this cannot be done by any man or woman in this church, great or small, without incurring the displeasure of the Almighty and without grieving the Spirit of God. I cannot do it, President Woodruff cannot do it, no Latter-day Saint can do it without grieving the Spirit of God and causing it to withdraw itself. The consequences, he said, are right before our eyes. And he urges all the saints, especially the young, men and women, to resolve never to speak evil. I'm reminded of Boyd Peterson's statement about Hugh Nibley, if you have something to complain about, shut your mouth. And this was kind of George Q. Cannon's attitude. Leave those who do wrong to the Lord. He will see to it that his servants are not permitted to lead this people astray. The first presidency did not seek their position. Whoever arrays himself, I'm quoting again, whoever arrays himself in any manner against the authority which God has placed in this church Unless he repents, God will withdraw his spirit and power from them. Well, now were the church, church leaders infallible or were they fallible? Oh, they were fallible. Only Christ was perfect. Nevertheless, here, and here's the emphasis that George Buchanan would set place. Nevertheless, God has chosen these men and God will judge them. He does not give authority to judge and condemn to man only in the regularly constituted councils of the church. Those who lift their voice and their heels against the authority of the holy priesthood, I tell you today as a servant of God, they will go down to hell unless they repent. <clears throat>